Hey guys, back with more fake mustache. When we last left Lenny and his friend Casper, they had just left Chauncey's big and small, short and stout, tall, where Casper had bought a sharp dressed man about town suit. So let's see what happens next. Hey, let's stop at here Sprinkle Hot Dog next, I said as we walked up the street. No thanks, said Casper. I don't want to get mustard on my suit. Can we at least stop in for a drink? I'm dying. I think I inhaled a pound of dust at Chauncey's. Casper glared at me. Look, I'm not going anywhere near that grease pit with this suit on. Well, if you're so worried about it, why don't you put your regular clothes back on? I have my reasons, says Casper. And why are you holding your hand over your face? There are people who shouldn't see me without the mustache, said Casper. I looked around. It looked like just the usual hair sprinkle kind of people, except there did seem to be more than the usual number of strolling accordion players. Look, he said, go have a hot dog if you want, but I'm going to Spins. All right, all right, I'm coming, I said. I don't think the stuff in Spins Fair Price Store changes very often, but there's so much of it that you can only see a tiny bit at a time. So every time you go in there, you see something new, like the sticky hand thing I told you about. I had never seen those before, so I decided to get one. Since it was almost Halloween, I noticed there were more costumes than usual, but I don't want a costume, so I looked in the stationery aisle. That's where I found a wet pets pen. It was a ballpoint pen, and the top end was made of clear plastic. Inside, there was grungy water and some flecks that seemed to be swimming around. It came with a little book called Care and Feeding of Your Water Hawks. It was seven ninety nine. And I was sort of thinking about getting one when Casper came over. They've raised the price on the Heidelberg handlebar, handlebar number seven, he moaned. How much money have you got? I ripped open the Velcro on my wallet. I had a $10 bill and a $1 bill. Let me have that $10, Casper begged. He seemed pretty upset, but I didn't really want to give him 10 bucks. Come on, it's my birthday, he said. But I already gave you a present, I said. It was junk, said Casper. I couldn't argue with that. About five years ago, my mother bought a bunch of famous presidents of history action figures at Sultan Savage store. Anytime I get invited to a birthday party, she makes me give one as a present. Nobody wants them, and that may be one reason I rarely get invited to birthday parties anymore. No offense, but who wants a Herbert Hoover action figure, sneered Casper. You owe me a real present. All right, fine, I said, and gave him the ten bucks. This, of course, was a terrible, terrible mistake. A mistake that would change the course of history. But please, please believe me that if I had known what that $10 would do, I would have never given it to Casper. Never. The Heidelberg handlebar, Heidelberg handlebar number seven was in a glass case. The cashier told us he wasn't permitted to open the case, so he went to get the manager who turned out to be a very, very angry looking lady wearing a name tag that said, hi, my name is Sven. She was text messaging someone with her cell phone and didn't even look up at us. I don't have time to fool around with the mustaches, she bellowed. Just get one of the cheap ones from the pile. She gestured to a stack of hundreds and hundreds of shrink wrapped fake mustaches. They were marked $2.99 and looked like they had been sitting there since before Sven was born. I'm interested in the Heidelberg handlebar number seven, said Casper. For the first time, Sven glanced up. She looked very closely at Casper. Her eyes went up and down, noting the sharp creases in his pants, the herringbone pattern in his suit coat, the way his suspenders hooked to his pants with buttons and not metal clamps. I beg your pardon, sir, she said, tossing her cell phone on the counter and pulling a tangled mass of keychains from her pocket. She rummaged through the mess until she found what seemed to be the only key. See, whispered Casper, the suit worked. Sven unlocked the cabinet and punched in a code on a little keypad to disable the alarm. There was a whooshing sound as the door opened. Using a long pair of tweezers, she picked up the mustache and then placed it in a felt-lined box, which she snapped shut when she was done. The cashier started to ring up the purchase on the cash register, but Sven put out a hand to stop him. One formality. The Heidelberg Novelty Company requires me to ask the purpose of your purchase. 
Our school is putting on a musical adaptation of the Hoboken Chicken Emergency, Casper replied, and I have been chosen to play the mayor. This was a complete and total lie. Impressive, said Sven, raising one side of the thick eyebrow that grew across her forehead. That is a role that takes real gravitas. The mustache will serve you well. Here, please take a complimentary year's supply of spirit gum. It will keep the mustache on your lip through thick and thin. Thank you, Sven, Casper said gravely, as she handed him a Ziploc bag containing a wad of goo. Proceed with the sale, Sven instructed the cashier. When Casper had paid, both Sven and the cashier looked at me expectantly. expectantly. I just want this, I said, and put the little green egg with the sticky hand on the counter. Sven wrinkled his nose in disgust. The cashier, sneering, hit a few buttons on the cash register and said, That'll be four fifty. But the sign said ninety-nine cents, I said. Just take it and get out of here, you pathetic, slightly short, nerdy seventh grader, bellowed Sven. Casper and I got back on the trolley and went home. Happy birthday, I said, just to be polite. Frankly, I was annoyed by everything that had happened. I had lost ten bucks, been treated like a child twice, and didn't even get a hair sprinkle hot dog. Casper looked me in the eye. He shook my hand and patted me on the shoulder. And then he said, Goodbye, Lenny. Wherever fate leads us tomorrow, please remember that we have walked far in friendship. Uh, yeah, real far. All right, um... See you, I said, with no idea why he was making such a big deal about stuff. I went home to supper. We eat supper in front of the TV, and we vote on what we want to watch. My mom, dad, and I all vote for different things. My sisters both always vote for the Jody O Rodeo Shodio. So they win every time. To tell you the truth, I'm too embarrassed to vote for it, but I don't really mind watching it. I mean, the plots are stupid, mostly about going to the mall. And now they're all reruns because the show was canceled. Worst of all, the singing is annoying and lip synced. But Jody O Rodeo, the preteen cowgirl queen, is the coolest girl I've ever seen. She rides a horse and does rope tricks, and it's pretty cute. It goes like this: Scene: Jody's bedroom. We see Jody sleeping in a tangle of sheets, blankets, and stuffed animals. A cell phone rings. Without getting up. Jody reaches for it, but picks up a cowgirl boot instead. Speaking into the boot, Jody says, Hello? She drops the boot and picks up a cell phone. Hello? Jody says again. Split screen showing Jody and her best friend, Cat. Cat, oh my gosh, Jody, what are you doing? I was sleeping, said Jody. Why aren't you at the mall? says Cat. Didn't I tell you, Jody said? I'm grounded. Cat asks, what for? Jody says, remember when I said my dad wouldn't mind if I borrowed his credit card to get those boots with the red, white, and blue fringe? Cat says, yeah, so? Jody says, well, he minded. Jody says, now, if you'll excuse me, I'm asleep. Okay, fine. Layla, I just thought you might want to know that your boyfriend is doing buying Shayla an orange Julius says Cat. Jody sits straight up in bed, sending her stuffed animal flying. Now I'm awake, says Jody. I'll be right there. I thought you were grounded, said Cat. Well, it's like old Grant says, sometimes it's better to break a rule than to break your heart. Second story window opens and Jody sticks head out a window and she hollers, hey yo, yo, Tito, soy milk. So I milled the winter horse gallops past at the house just as Jody jumps from the window and lands perfectly on soy milk's back. Shots of soy milk galloping across town, weaving in and out of traffic, jumping fences while Jody rides, yodels, and sings her new single, You're Breaking My Rule About Breaking My Heart. This was the episode about someone trying to rob the Orange Julius stand at the mall, so Jody O'Rodeo had to ride her horse down the escalator and lasso the robbers. Then she yodeled, and then her boyfriend gave her the Orange Julius he had bought for Shayla, who accidentally stepped in horse poo. I've seen the episode so many times, I think I've learned how to yodel just by watching it. But I haven't figured out how they did the horse on the escalator trick. After supper, I practiced using my new sticky hand. 
It turned out to be pretty hard to pick up anything with, even a penny that was just a few feet away. I was just starting to get the hang of it when Dad told me I was driving him crazy and made me go to bed. The next morning, when I went into the kitchen, my mom and dad were watching the Good Morning Hair Sprinkle Show. They watch it every morning, even though it's the same people shouting at each other or sharing cookie tips. But this morning, there was actual news. Look, Lenny Jr., someone robbed the first bank of hair sprinkle, my dad said. Since he's Lenny Sr., he always calls me Lenny Jr. This is the national news. Hair sprinkle is actually on the national news. Look, Pudding Cup, that's our bank. I was just there last week, said my mom. When I was a baby, I liked pudding, so she still calls me Pudding Cup. It's better than what she calls my sisters. Wow, I'm lucky to be alive. I wonder if News Attack wants to interview me, she said. Look, said my dad, it's Giorgio Jim McPlunkett, the famous CNT News Attack anchor. He's right here in... This is Giorgio Jim McPlunkett, the famous CNT News Attack anchor. Reporting live from Hair Sprinkle, where the first ever billion dollar bank robbery was carried out in the wee hours of the morning by a gang of strolling accordion players. Police have arrested several members of the gang, all of whom claim to have no idea what is going on, but haven't found the missing money or the ringleader. The bank security's cameras caught the robbery on film, and as you can see, the ringleader appears to be a short, well-dressed man about town, sporting a spectacular handlebar mustache. Later at school, I ran into Casper in the hall. Hey, Lenny, I'm sorry about yesterday, Casper said. Which part? I asked. The part where I complained about your birthday present and made you give me $10. Herbert Hoover is actually a great action figure. I want to give you your money back. He handed me a bill. Uh, Casper, this is a $10,000 bill. Whoopsie, he said, taking it back. He rooted around in his backpack for a minute, then pulled out a 10. I just looked at it. Finally, I said, Casper, did you rob a bank last night? What bank? said Casper. The bank downtown that got robbed. Really? Casper said. There was a bank robbery? Yeah, really. It's all over the news. The national news. Huh. Well, you know we don't have a TV, so I didn't see the news. The homeroom bell rang. Tell me about it at lunch, said Casper, and he pushed the $10 bill into my hand and headed down the hall. I looked at the bill. It was stiff and crisp, like a bill that had just come fresh from the bank. I realized that Casper had never answered my question. So what do you guys think? Do you think Casper's robbing banks? We'll have to find out next week.